Hello everyone, William Hopewell here, and I present to you Laura Croft and the Frozen Omen. Laura Croft and the Frozen Omen is a standalone story that takes place within the Laura Croft spin-off series of Tomb Raider. Previous knowledge of the past adventures isn't needed, and anyone can just jump into this mini-series without worry. In its entirety, The Frozen Omen is a compilation rather than a true graphic novel. It consists of five issues that were released from October 2015 through February 2016, with the compilation released on July of 2016. In total, the compilation is 120 pages, but if you were to eliminate the credit pages or cover illustrations, the entire story spans about 116 pages. The compilation was published by Dark Horse Comics. They're also known for publishing comics for Alien, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, American Gods, Hellboy, and Terminator, among other ones as well. Karina Bechko wrote the story for Laura Croft and the Frozen Omen. She's also written for Angel, Star Wars, Invisible Republic, and Deep Gravity. Jean Sebastian Rosbach did the cover illustrations for all five issues in which the first cover art was used for the compilation cover. Randy Green, Carmen Canaro, and Robert Adkins all contributed to the penciling of the story, with each of them covering their own set amount of pages. Also contributing is Andy Owens, who provided the inks. He's inked other comics like Castle, Captain Marvel, Tomb Raider, and Batgirl. Color Michael Itia brought the story to life and also worked on Spider Woman, Darksiders 2, Justice League, and Another Dangerous Woman, Black Widow. Last but not least, Michael Heisler provided the lettering for the story. He's also lettered for numerous Star Wars, Supergirl, Aquaman, and also Serenity issues. While these are rough estimates, I found these to be the most logical act breaks. Act 1 spans pages 7 through 33. We see Laura Croft in a sense of normalcy before she feels the need to find a stolen prehistoric ivy figure. Discovering that her friend Professor John stole the artifact and wasn't acting normal, Laura chases him down and boards his flight to Belize where it's revealed that he's possessed before being killed. The artifact is stolen by another possessed man and the act ends with Carter calling a defeated Laura with a lead in Turkey. As this is happening, we're given a glimpse of the villain Mr. Green, who's committed to bringing the apocalypse since he's possessed by the unnameable. Act 2 covers page 34 through 87 and continues Laura and Carter's investigation. Carter reveals an ivory piece he was working on and took it with him after he was attacked. The two find themselves chased through Istanbul and their piece is stolen. Meanwhile, the villain obtains yet another piece from underwater. Landing in Arizona, Laura and Carter meet up with Gruss, who knows that the ivory pieces will bring forth destruction and also has an ivory, ivory piece under lock and key. When Gruss is possessed, he throws Laura and Carter into a freezer and escapes with his piece. A sympathetic security guard frees Laura and Carter and drives them into the desert. From there, Laura and Carter survive the heat until they can find civilization in the form of a strip mall. Mr. Green assembles all the ivory pieces and waits for Dawn with a few others he's possessed, including Russ. Act 3 spans pages 88 through 116. Laura and Carter rush to Crayosho, where Mr. Green's house is located. Attacked by shadowy demons, the two are eventually free from battle when the break of dawn destroys the demons until a giant monster rises up from the ground. With the ground cracking into a fiery underbelly, the two take shelter in a house. Eventually discovering Mr. Green's hideout, a cave, the two try to stop the destruction as it spreads and Laura jumps on Mr. Green and snaps his horns returning him to normal to deal with his grief. The destruction stops and the majority of the ivory pieces are destroyed at Gruss's request, except for a piece Laura steals since she couldn't smash it with it being such a beauty.
Since this is a standalone miniseries, the story starts off with a clear beginning, rises up in the middle, and concludes with a satisfactory ending. I would say that this story barely scratches the line that follows our model of having Act 1 and 3 covering one fourth of the story, while Act 2 holds the bulk of the story. With how I believe where Acts 1 and 3 are, those two added together are bigger than Act 2 by a page or so. Granted her name is part of the title, but besides Lord Croft, her friend Carter Bell also plays a significant role in the story. They work together to discover the truth behind these ivory artifacts, the cultists that want to use them, and essentially in the end save the world from destruction if these cultists were to achieve their goal. The conflict spread throughout Act 2 supports this in a way that Laura and Carter are forced to investigate the significance and try to find these other ivory pieces, while dealing with possessed human enemies that hunt down, attempt to eliminate or temporarily halt the two from discovering the truth and stopping the main villain. Other than the main conflicts, Laura and Carter don't really change much. While all the characters were fully dynamic and engaging, especially Laura and Carter, no one changes from start to finish. It may be because this story and its main characters are part of a larger series and any kind of significant changes would be frowned upon and discarded. I would have liked to see minor characters change over time, but those characters aren't nearly given enough time or significance to make that transition. Within the story, it's easy to follow as story transitions from one scene to another. If it takes place in a completely different country, it's clearly pointed out in a description box. If it's in the same country, but let's say changes from indoor to outdoor, the environment's detail helps to convey this. Sometimes the colors used in a specific scene emphasize the environment like shades of blue to emit the coldness of a freezer. Shades of red display not only fire, but evil and gives a sense of urgency while brown and tans create the desert landscape of Arizona. In the case of McLeod's ideas of transition, the story uses both subject-to-subject -subject and action-to-action -action techniques. Within action scenes, action-to-action -action is often shown with Laura or Carter as they progress through a specific movement in a single scene, like Laura jumping or fighting whatever creature comes her way. I would also see instances of subject to subject that would call for more involvement of myself as a reader, like the placing of each ivory artifact by each individual. We don't see their faces, but we're forced to interpret that each panel holds a different individual. While not every page is designed as a mini comic, the majority of them end in some minor cliffhanger in one way or another. Whether it's Laura saying found you, a car pulling up into a driveway at night to a mysterious house with the main characters questioning it, or Carter asking a question like, so where's the other one? There's always something, whether major or minor, to pull the reader into the next page to find out what happens next. The directional flow is easy to follow due to the clean artwork and minimal text with sound effects used spar sparingly when needed to help emphasize action scenes. Panels aren't in weird or awkward spots that disrupt the simple flow, and I had an easy time following some of the more action-packed scenes. Now, would I recommend this to my classmates? Well, yes and no. It's fun, clean, and a mature read with a complete story from start to finish that's easy to follow, but since we're writers and one of our focal points tends to be character development, I wouldn't recommend this comic because of that single fact. Laura nor Carter evolve over the course of the story, and there could have been something minor added to make this happen. Would I also recommend this to my friends? Yeah. I thoroughly enjoy reading this, but I don't see them ever attempting to pick it up because we're all busy with school, work, or other responsibilities that demands the most out of us. However, if they did, it's a fun adventure with twists and turns that would keep them glued to the entire compilation from start to finish. While this is a standalone story without needing to know anything about Laura Croft, Carter Bell, or any of the previous adventures, Laura Croft and the Frozen Omen is a part of the Laura Croft spin-off series which focuses on more classic versions of Laura Croft compared to her newest, younger, rebooted counterpart in the main Tomb Raider series. 
The spin-off series started with the video game Lara Croft and the Garden of Light and was followed by a sequel, Lara Croft and the Temple of Osiris, in which Lara Croft first appears with Carter Bell, where they act as rivals before becoming friends. The spin-off series has also gone into other formats, such as a free mobile game, Lara Croft Relic Run, in which Laura searches for Carter Bell and Laura Croft in the Blade of Guinevere, a full-fledged novel. Thank you all for watching.